Hello. Hi, John. Lizzie Lassiter. Hi, Lizzie. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Thank you for agreeing to speak with me. I'm already recording, so we'll just launch right in, I suppose. Okay, that sounds good to me. If that works for you. Where are you exactly? Tell us where in the world you are right now. <laughs> I'm at home, uh -huh. uh, which is in Maryland, not just that side of Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm working at uh, my home office for the afternoon and then heading into teach classes at Unity Woods tonight. How many classes a week are you teaching these days? Well, I teach six regular classes at Unity Woods every week. And then um, I probably teach at least one weekend a month and sometimes two or part of a second. Uh -huh. So the thank you again for agreeing to do this interview with me. The series is basically, it's a very kind of candid, open look behind the scenes, talking to yoga teachers about their practice. Uh -huh. So the idea is kind of my insights from growing up with a yoga teacher. I've seen um, her practice evolve over the years. And my intuition mm -hmm. is that a lot of people who are newer to the practice have a kind of... Um, illusion about what it's like to practice yoga for 40 years. So I'm, I'm just trying to get behind some of these, um, to get at some of these questions. I'm fascinated by what it's like a lifetime as a householder and also someone who's called to teach yoga and share this teaching. Okay. So, um, yeah, my first question would just be sort of what was your practice like today? What... What is a typical weekday um, asana, pranayama meditation practice like for you? Okay. Well, I start off uh, with pranayama, mm -hmm. and I do that anywhere from mm, 45 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. And then I have a sitting practice. I usually will read uh, the sutras for 10 or 15 minutes, <clears throat> and then uh, sit. Uh, for 20 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's what I did this read the sutras for actually that 20 minutes this morning, and uh, then because um, I'm giving a talk on karma on Sunday night, you know, he was and I just was reading a little more about karma, mm -hmm. and then I then I sat for 20 minutes. <clears throat> then I take a break and usually do some stuff around the house, and when I got the paper, um, I uh, swept the porches and uh, did some work at the pool, at the swimming pool. Spend about 45 minutes or an hour, and then I come back and do anywhere from uh, an hour and a half to two hours of life. So this rhythm, did, is this something that you saw from Mr. Iyengar, or is this particular sequence and length of practice something which you've developed yourself? Well, it's certainly affected by Mr. Iyengar, but... Um, uh, and my pranayama practice has grown directly out of my uh, work with him. Although I did uh, do some pranayama before I began Iyengar Yoga, because I did uh, five years of just all kinds of yoga, and then five years of mostly yoga from uh, Iyengar's book. Mm -hmm. And then with him after those ten years. Uh, uh, so um, since there are uh, time requirements, I mean, you can't eat before you do pranayama. Mm -hmm. and you shouldn't eat right after, and you shouldn't do a strong asana practice either right before or right after. So it makes sense to me to just get up and do a pranayama practice first thing, then all those questions are out of the way. Um, and also, uh, you know, the, one of the classic times for doing pranayama is early in the morning because it's quieter than in the air structure. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, as much as anything, base, is the basis for my starting that way, and uh, and. Uh, I think are also suggested to get up and do pranayama first as well. Mm -hmm. So all of this is to play. So if I have to leave time between pranayama and asana, that's why I put a sitting practice in there. And as you know, um, the Iyengar method doesn't really have a, a formal sitting practice component to it. Mm -hmm. not, not very much in. Um, but I think that's important. Uh, and so that I put that in there. And besides that, one of the sutras on pranayama says that it prepares the mind for meditation. Mm -hmm. So make it to go right from there into, uh, into a sitting practice. And then uh, the asana practice, 
Um, in light on yoga, uh, I suggest that um, you do a strong asana practice in the morning and then do an inversion practice in the afternoon. And I did that for a lot of years. And I was also influenced by Donna Holloman mm-hmm. a lot after that. <clears throat> she was such a strong practitioner and so regular and, and consistent in her practice. And so um, for lots of years, I did a strong asana practice in the morning and then I would do an hour of uh, inversion in the afternoon. At this stage in my life, um, I don't uh, do a second asana practice in the afternoon. So what inversions I do, I do as part of my morning practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, traveling and things come up and all this gets changed period, every now and then. But that's basically and pretty consistently what I do from day to day. Did you, have you ever <clears throat> struggled with consistency? No. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> I first started uh, practicing in 1970, uh, I, com- I committed myself to an hour a day. And at that time, I was working out of Swami Vishnu Devananda's book, Complete Illustrated Book of Yoga, uh-huh. uh, given me that book. And um, I, uh, you know, I decided that I wanted to do something physical to take care of myself. And uh, after a few other things, yoga wound up being in, and I was determined to spend an hour a day. And at that time, I was teaching school. I was working at a small private school in Virginia. And I would come home and have a quiet hour before I was in a group house, before other people in the group house would get home. So that was when I practiced then. And from that time on, I was really consistent in my practice. It just uh, wasn't a problem. Mm-hmm. You're very lucky. <laughs> I think, yes, yeah, so take us back a little bit to, to your start. So you started, you came to yoga through books, and then you it, it immediately started with a home practice for you. That's right. That's right. That's, that's how it all began. Which seems, it seems sort of to fit also with just the, the time back then. There weren't yoga studios on every corner. We're so spoiled now that we can go to class. Yeah, well, there weren't any of the studios, in fact, um, in the Washington area in 1970. Um, there were a few people teaching at um, rec departments and uh, dance schools and uh, little small private studios in their home or living rooms, really, basements. And that was pretty much it, and I didn't know anybody who did yoga at that point, so that's, that was my source, was, uh, was books. Do you think there's a benefit to that? Do you wish that students now had to kind of go through a, a six-month trial period where they practiced on their own before they would come to the studio? No, I don't think so. I think there is an advantage to it, and that is uh, I was self-motivated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a really important element. If you're having to drag yourself either to a class or to your mat uh, day in, day out, you're not going to probably last all that long doing that. There has to be some uh, interest uh, and uh, commitment and self-motivation to make it work. One thing that um, I think is advantageous uh, about practicing on one's own uh, as opposed to class is that um, you sort of get to learn about yourself in your own fashion, in your own way, Mm -hmm. uh, at your own and so I wasn't pushed too fast, or I wasn't held back either. Um, I see in Iyengar Yoga that lots of people spend, oh, years doing standing poses and standing poses. They're great poses, but there's other stuff. And I think people get a little stagnated doing endless standing poses in the Iyengar method and, you know, vinyasas and other methods, and each method has its own um, pluses and minuses. So I think uh, being able to explore uh, a wide range uh, uh, follow my nose in a sense, literally and figuratively, um, was was an advantage. Of course, one of the disadvantages is I made terrible mistakes and um, uh, developed bad habits. And when I finally got with a teacher, it took me a while to overcome. But I think the the benefit outweighed the drawback um, for those early years, uh, given that at some point you do have to have a teacher. Yeah, I I always feel as though when I go to a class, I'm doing someone else's practice, which exactly is, is lovely. But then I want to go home and experiment on my own. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so can you describe the moment when you first um, encountered? So you encountered Mr. Iyengar through first through Light on Yoga. Yes. And yeah, then... I thought somebody. I... 
I worked uh, this the series, the sequences in the back of the book mm-hmm. for five years. Uh, and then um, I went to um, a workshop with Karen Steffen, uh, just a one, two-hour class in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and uh, that, um, that let me know that I really had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> because, you, you, know, you know, this works. Uh, studying from the book is invaluable, and there's wonderful stuff in there. But once you get with a real teacher, you realize that all the subtleties, the refinements, um, the precision, the information, it's, it's, it's just not in there. There's no room for that kind of stuff in a book. Mm-hmm. So I said I needed to study with a teacher at that point. And very shortly thereafter, Victor von Koten uh, was giving a two-week intensive up in Cambridge, Mass. So I went up there and did that for two weeks, and it changed my life, actually. It was, mm-hmm. it was then that I decided to go to India to study with uh, Mr. Angar, uh, because, frankly, up until that time, I had, while well, I thought his book was great and I learned a lot from it, I wasn't particularly interested in studying with him because, you know, I was I was a peace and love hippie kind of guy. I had hair down below my shoulder blades and a beard down below my sternum. Mm. And um, it's all about peace and love and being together. Uh, and uh, he was, you know, running around, you know, BK Slap, BKS. And that was the reputation he had, and I thought, I'm it. I've never that's heard that so. before. Beat kick slap. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but then after that, two, those two weeks with Victor, who is sitting, uh, yeah, I think you know Victor, mm-hmm. <laughs> the, one of the sweetest humans alive, and humorous, and um, warm, and brilliant, really, as a teacher. I thought this, and, and he at that time was very close to anger. It was like a son to uh, to BKS. And so I thought, there's got to be more to um, because I uh than what I know if somebody like Victor von Coden loves and uh, honors him. So I said, the only way to find that is go see for myself. So uh, that was just toward the end of the days when you could write a letter to because I and say, I'd like to come study with you. And he'd write back and say, we're doing a three-week intensive starting in January. It's $250. Make your own arrangements. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's ju- so it's what year is that? I wrote in 1980 and uh, 80 and went in January of 81. Okay. So January of 1981, I cannot even imagine. I go to Pune every winter now. I cannot even imagine what Pune was like in 1981. Dirt roads, probably. <laughs> well, there were some dirt roads. There were some paved roads, too. It was still a city. We had a million people in it at that time. Oh, wow. Um, which is not that big by Indian standards, but it was a fair sized city. Um, but there were very few cars. It was mostly scooters and rickshaws and animals mm-hmm. in the streets mm-hmm. um, and pedestrians and bicycles. Uh, very few cars. Uh, telephones, uh, you know, now you can go to an STD phone and put your call in and just watch the, watch the screen to see how much time you're spending, how much it's costing, and your connection is immediate, and it's, it's as good as somebody next door. Um, whereas in those days, you used to call the operator, and then the operator would call you back in... Five minutes, or two hours, or six hours, or maybe the next day, or maybe not at all. <laughs> so making a phone call was a big deal. No televisions, um, no air conditioning. Uh, so yeah, it was it was quite different. So you what you walked into the institute and you took your first class with BKS. What was your reaction? Ah, well, um, I was. Uh, Nervous. I was apprehensive. Uh, I was uh, a little surprised when he came in the room. First, uh, I didn't happen to look at him as he came in the room, but I could tell he had come into the room. He just had, even in those days, a, a presence mm-hmm. um, that you could palpable. Um, and but I was also surprised that he was much smaller physically than I, I thought. He looks big in the book. Um, <laughs> but he's short. He wasn't that tall, and you know, he was kind of. Um, physically not that imposing, but energetically he was overwhelming. Uh, and so he, uh, there were probably 30, 35 people in that class. And he positioned, he sat a stand in Tadasana and positioned us all and did where he wanted us in the room. Each person had their spot, and that's where we stayed for the next three weeks. Um, and uh, I don't remember much about that first class past that. Uh, he didn't really pay much attention to me for about a week and a half. Mm-hmm. And then after a week and a half, 
Uh, I was uh, standing with my foot on the wall in the Hospital Padang one, mm-hmm. and he came over and he said, and look at this fellow. He thinks he's a really good practitioner. His hip is dropped. His leg isn't straight. He's leaning backwards. This fellow knows nothing. Whack, whack, whack. Start straight up there. Lift up here. Move that in. Stick, you know. Sit. For the next week and a half, he was on me like, um, as uh, Martin Jackson once said, like a terrier on a rat. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was it. He was merciless with me for the next week and a half. So by the end of the three weeks, I couldn't get out of India fast enough. I had actually intended to spend a week down on the beach in Goa uh, after the three-week intensive, but I changed my plans, and the, the day after the intensive was over, I went home. Oh, wow. And then what changed? Why did you go back? Well, you know, not only was the, the yoga so intense, and Mr. Iyengar so, so intense, um, but uh, emotionally, it was a, a roller coaster ride for me. I was, uh, I, I left home at a fairly early age. I was in boarding schools a lot and summer camps. And um, so I'd done homesickness when I was, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. And being away and being away from home and all of that never fazed me. But I actually felt homesickness in India. Mm-hmm. Uh, the culture was different um, and uh, so overwhelming. I mean, you've been to India when you first go. It's the sights, the sounds, the smell, everything. It's so different. Uh, plus, I'm being taken apart by the yoga. Mm-hmm. So in the mornings, I would get up and I'd go, I would be like a prisoner in a prison cell, scratching days off your sentence, you know, on the wall. Um, go, oh, my God, only 10 more days, only five more days. Um, but by the end of the day, the yoga had transformed me, energized me, smoothed me out. I felt so good physically and mentally because of the yoga. Uh, that I would sit up on the roof of the Shreyas Hotel and uh, watch the parrots fly over as the sun set and the breeze wafted through the palm trees, and, and I was ready to spend the rest of my life in India mm-hmm. until the next morning when I would have to go to class and I couldn't get out of India fast enough. <laughs> so I was a complete bad case by the end of three weeks. I wondered about that when I got back home. Uh, what was going on there? You know, What happened to you uh, that put you through all those changes? So I was curious to to go back for that reason, but more importantly, um, I found that uh, my practice was completely transformed Mm -hmm. of what I did and how I did it and how I thought about it and what I paid attention to. Um, Very different, and I was teaching in those days, and I had been teaching for seven years at that point, Uh, and um, so my teaching was always based on my practice, and so my teaching began to change also, Mm. Uh, and uh, all these changes uh, happened, and I felt, you know, I, I've learned something, but I've only begun to scratch the surface here, and I I, uh, I need to go back and uh, study more and understand this better than I do right now. So those are the reasons I went back. So you, how old were you at the time? Well, let's see, in 1980, the December, I was 35 years old. I, I love this progression. Hearing this is is because, you know, now so many people, so many people go. They've, they've been doing yoga for a year, and then they take a teacher training, and then they start teaching. And it's so great to hear uh, almost the slowness of the progression. You had been practicing on your own, then you were teaching for seven years before you first met Iyengar, and how how really a lifelong study this has become. I I, I find that soothing to hear actually that it took so long <laughs> yeah well as you said it's uh, pretty much plop plop fizz fizz these days uh, people do a weekend and a certified teacher and uh, that's it yeah so, uh, i i think that um uh, it takes a while for all of this stuff to be learned and absorbed and uh, i'm grateful for having taken it at a slow pace really yeah so so Earlier you were saying that reading the sutras is part of your morning practice every day. Um, have, is that something you've been doing for decades? Well, let's see, I probably started doing that in the mid, think, the mid-80s. So yeah, for decades. Uh, I actually began doing the sutras in part. Uh, I memorized them mm-hmm. uh, as a mental exercise as much as for the sutras themselves, although that changed once I started to really study them. Uh, so I memorized them in English. I had uh, a translation by I.K. Taimi, The Science of Yoga. 
and that was uh, that happened to be the secret book that I had. Uh, and so I went through and memorized the English, and then I went back and memorized the Sanskrit. And um, I do a sutra, and then the next day I do that sutra and another sutra. And then the next day I do that sutra, that sutra, and another sutra. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I couldn't remember the first sutra, I'd go back and I'd stay with them until I could go straight through, and then I'd add another one. And it took years to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, when I, and since I had no Sanskrit, and uh, I was reading transliterations in the book, I pronounced them phonetically. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> I remember going to a, a conference one time, <clears throat> at which I was teaching, but also uh, Gary Kraft's, I don't know if you know yeah, Gary or not. I do, yeah. Um, he's a great guy and a brilliant scholar. And, uh, so I, it was the first talk I'd ever been to on the sutras. He was giving a talk on the sutras. So I thought, oh good, I'll get to learn something from somebody else. So I went and listened to his talk. It was a great talk. I don't remember quite what it was about. But afterwards, I had this uh, sutra that I was having trouble understanding exactly what it meant. And so I went to him and I said, Gary, um, I had a sutra. I'd like you to have you say something about it for me. He said, sure. And I had the sutra to him in Sanskrit. Um, and he said, I don't know that sutra. I've never heard of that sutra before. <laughs> and um, so I said, oh, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll go back and try to figure out what, you know, what, I'm, what I'm trying to ask you here. Well, my pronunciation was so bad, so completely off the wall, that it was unrecognizable to anybody who knew how to pronounce these things. So I realized that uh, I need to get tape. <laughs> to <start> to <laughs> so, so the, yeah, the studying the sutras, what, what, something I wanted to ask you about is how your practice informs or has informed the kind of real work you do every day running a business and uh, several studios, which means managing people and schedules and personalities and money. And so have you found um, great insight and direction from the sutras or your yoga practice in general? How has it informed your work as a businessman? Well, um, a lot. First off, uh, the, since my business is yoga, mm. uh, and it is uh, sort of my guiding light in my life and um, my reason for being, uh, then everything grows out of that commitment to yoga. So that's that's uh, uh, there's no question about um, what what the mission for the business is, uh, and it's just a matter of finding uh, techniques um, and methods uh, to further that. Uh, that mission. Uh, so uh, the yamas and the niyamas, of course, in the sutras are are, are our guides to how to deal with uh, other people and how to deal with ourselves in the world. And uh, I'm uh, a very imperfect practitioner of the yamas and niyamas. Uh, I do study them and I'm familiar with them and I I, uh, I revisit them in my heart and my mind. Um, quite regularly in an attempt to try to conform what I do, uh, both personally and um, in my business, Mm -hmm. to those guys. So yesterday I spoke with Richard Miller, who um, Mm -hmm. has a background, a staggering background in terms of what he studied from Taoism to uh, acupuncture to Hatha Yoga um, Zen meditation. So, have you, outside of kind of the direct Iyengar lineage, um, have you studied a lot of other um, fields, or have you gone really deep in in one field? Uh, I haven't studied a lot of other fields. I've gone deep in one field. So, I had those ten years before I committed myself to studying with Mr. Angar. I studied with Swami Sachidananda, with Swami Vishnu Devananda. Um, with Joel Kramer, um, with um, Indra Devi, mm-hmm. uh, workshops or uh, classes here and there, or weekend retreats. Um, so I had, uh, you know, Yogi Bhajan, three show stuff. Uh, that's the only thing I really hadn't. Um, well, there wasn't anything back then because secret didn't exist back then. <laughs> so um, I did. Uh, I did just read everything that was available and checked it out. Uh, but it was all yoga. I wasn't too interested in um, acupuncture or um, uh, reflexology or other sorts of uh, uh, methods or schools. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I was in, I was in the dick role. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you you. 1981 is your first trip to Pune, and then did you go back consistently every year to study with BKS, or how did that evolve, your relationship with him? I went back in 82, so mm-hmm. I went back the next year in August of 82. Oh, August. So the year, <laughs> August, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, actually, August is monsoon, the hot month is May, and uh, as you know, and, uh, and uh, so the monsoon was kind of like that year, actually, so it was not at all uncomfortable. Um, his, uh, our interaction was very, very different that second year. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he, he still, you know, gave me a swat every now and then and shouted at me like everybody else. But um, he, I think that he saw that in the year and a half since I'd been there, uh, that I had worked really, really hard on what I'd learned from him. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a skillful, fairly skillful practitioner when I went there. I was just an ignorant practitioner, mm-hmm. um, and so uh, uh, I, I didn't have, I, I wasn't uh, afraid of him, and he wasn't um, unkind or harsh with me, uh, and uh, I just we, I felt um, a, a loving relationship with him and it built in, in that second time that I went. Um, I felt that he was giving to me. Uh, and I think everybody in those classes felt he was giving to them personally. He was just, just a, um, a brilliant teacher that way that everybody felt like they were being spoken to directly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I felt that. Uh, and I think I was also, um, uh, as based on the, the years that we spent together after that. So um, uh, from then on, my, uh, my going to India wasn't every year. I usually went every other year. Sometimes... Mm-hmm every third year and sometimes two years in a row so I would probably average out to every couple of years two and a half years I'd go mm-hmm. and um, what are you going to do now? <laughs> now I, do you, you know, know it? yeah uh, I don't know um, The I went last December mm-hmm. for Kassanam the, the uh, intensive that he gave mm-hmm. uh, you know, after his death, and um, I'm not going this year. She's doing another intensive in December, and a meeting for assessors and certification issues. Uh, this, I went to, to his 95th birthday the year before the Yoganashin uh, Yoganushasana mm-hmm. conference. So I had gone two years in a row, and you know I have family and business and uh, home, yeah. uh, and so I'm not going to go this year. Uh, I don't know, frankly. It depends on. Um, what they do uh, over at the Institute, uh, what kind of programs they offer. I doubt that I would go for public classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would probably go if Gita offered intensives because mm-hmm. she's, she was the second best yoga teacher in the world and now she's the best yoga teacher in the world, <laughs> um, for my view, obviously. Uh, and um, so I would go to study with her. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Abhi. Uh, Abhi is, a, she's young, but she's mature beyond her years, and she's trained so much directly with Guruji, and um, uh, and she's also uh, very bright and uh, tremendous presence. Um, I don't know if I would, she's, you know, I've been doing this about four times longer than, uh, actually, I've been doing this longer, twice as long as she's been alive. Um, so, I'm not sure that, um, that I would go take class with Abhi. If she came here, I would certainly go to study yeah. with her, but I'm not sure I would go to India to do it. Uh, maybe in 10 years after she's seasoned and I'm only 80 years old then, then maybe I would uh, go over who's to say. But I don't, I don't know at this point, Lizzie, to tell you the truth. No, that's, that's completely fair. It's a, it's a strange transition. You know, it's a morning and a shift. What, what do you see when you said when you're 80? I mean, what do you see kind of the next 20 years if you look forward into the, into the sunset? What do you see with your asana practice and your teaching, do you, do you want to drop dead on the mat or what's your kind of dream? <laughs> yeah, I know. I always talk about doing that. Um, well, uh, I, I still love my practice and I still love my teaching. I have no desire to retire. Mm-hmm. Um, I might imagine, uh, as, as, uh, Anger did, uh, putting back on teaching, um, just because you only have so much energy, um, in terms of regular, teaching uh, three or four days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I can't imagine not practicing. 
But even if I'm not teaching, I would practice for my own self, which is why I started in the first place. Mm-hmm. I would start to become, which a lot of people do these days. I, you know, we get people calls at the center, people call in and say, I'd like to be a yoga teacher. Do you have a teacher training? And I said, well, what, what kind of practice have you been doing? Well, I haven't done any yoga classes yet, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they want to be you take a yoga class. Ridiculous. Um, so um, I would continue to practice uh, till. Well, you can always do something, so I guess till the day I die. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that's the perfect place to end. <laughs> John, thank you. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much <laughs> for um, spending time with me, with us, through the magic of the internet, and sharing. Well, it, the I can tell the kind of I, I appreciate your honesty. In, in, in sharing um, your personal journey and um, where you see it going from here and the evolution of your practice. It's been quite a pleasure. Well, thank you, Lydia. It's a pleasure to be here.